Harrison Price for Tuesday, March 26, 2024, coming to you from the Go Goat Sports Studio, built by Arbor Lee here at the Iconic Wall Center, downtown Vancouver. You're heading to a game, an event downtown. Call the wall, 604 331 1000. Make it a staycation. Ask for the Harrison Price rate. Some blackout date supply. Matt Sikaris alongside Irfan Gafar, who's sitting in for Blake Price this week. Great sass hitting switches, conducting things. Got a big show planned for you. It's all brought to you by Applewood Auto Group. We're right now at Applewood Infinity in Richmond, the 2023 QX50. You can lease or finance from 0% plus non-stack cash up to $10,000. The 2023 QX50 and QX55, that's what I'm driving. Absolutely Love it. Gorgeous vehicle. You can lease from 1.99% up to 33 months, plus $1,500 bonus cash. As they say, it's all good at Applewood. Tim Horton's poll question today. We're asking you, would you do the Elias Lindholm trade again? Yes or no? You can vote at Secure Some Price on Twitter. Or YouTube, roll up to win is here for Tim's 60th anniversary. You play on the Tim's app to win prizes. Daily cash jackpot, $10,000 can win the all-electric Volkswagen ID4 and a sun-soaked Hilton getaway. Download the Tim's app. Roll up is on until March 31st. Great to see you. Thanks for sitting in this week. I Absolutely. appreciate you sitting in for me yesterday as I was uh, making my way back from Vegas. Uh, first things first, I'm going to get you on a poll question, buddy. Um, where do you stand? The Elias Lindholm trade. Would you do it again? Absolutely. I uh, and I think that from the get-go, maybe the timing of it is, I think, a little bit different as to what people might suggest of our, our poll question here. But you're making that trade for, you know, for depth. Obviously, you, you're making that trade for a playoff run. That was your all-in move for mm-hmm. the Vancouver Canucks. As it turns out, Earth. Yeah, and they made it at the end of January. They didn't make it at the March 8 deadline. So I 100% would do that trade again. I think that we're going to see the benefits of Elias Lindholm um, in the playoffs when they do, when they need him. Scratch last night. Yeah. Nagging injury. Got him a rest day. It's nine points in 22 games as a Vancouver Canuck. But of course, you got him thinking he was going to play with your best players in the top six. You tried him on the wing. Coach talk it on record saying he is a center. I got to play him in the middle. And so that meant bumping him down to third line center where he's not playing with the, the, the level of winger that can help the points and, and, and be productive from that standpoint. Now he's a good defensive player. I think we've all seen that. He's a good penalty killer. Yeah. And of course you got him for the Stanley cup playoffs. So there's still a lot of runway left here because the Canucks, though they failed to clinch a playoff spot on Monday are going back to the playoffs that much. We know, and you know, they could be a pretty tough matchup down the mid- middle. If you're playing Miller, Pedersen and Lindholm. Now I voted no at the moment, but I leave open the possibility that this could still turn in the Vancouver Canucks favor. We'll see where it goes. The other thing, and you were just mentioning to me before we started, Irv, you were starting to see some frontline NHL players now mm-hmm. getting scratched. Load, man- load management yeah. scratch. Load management has arrived at the National Hockey League, everybody. I was it Tyler Sagan? Tyler Sagan not playing for mm-hmm. the Dallas Stars tonight um, in San Jose, so you can probably bet he's in against the Canucks on Thursday. He's also coming back from an injury, but... It's something that you're going to see more and more now, I I think. And it's especially interesting here because once the Canucks eventually do clinch, if they do perhaps clinch on Thursday or what have you, a a playoff spot, I just wonder what this team looks like in that final week before game one, that Wednesday, or sorry, that Thursday Thursday game against the Winnipeg Jets. If they do, in fact, end up playing on Saturday night here at Rogers Arena to open. I wonder who plays. Yeah, that game. and uh, we'll get to that. Uh, we'll get to that in a moment here. Yeah. Uh, just to finish the point on Lindholm, I would rather they sit him down and get him well for the Stanley Cup last right now than let him play through something that's going to be aggravating, that's going to be nagging, that could get worse between now and the Stanley Cup playoffs with 10 games to go. Uh, you mentioned it. You broke the story here because, and look, 
I'm sure we probably fixate on it a little bit more than Joe and Joanne public, but for months, the NHL's website, critical dates (laughs) listed Monday, April 22nd as the beginning of the Stanley cup playoffs. There was no press release issued on this, unless I'm mistaken. The critical dates have now changed April 20th, now the first day of the Stanley Cup playoffs. No, absolutely. And uh, I think that moving it back, obviously, there's a bunch of stuff that went into consideration, building availabilities and all sorts of things. Obviously, uh, the broadcast partners wanting to have weekend dates to start, you know, what some might call the best playoff in sports. Why not start it on the weekend? Um, And if you're a fan of the Vancouver Canucks, you're probably looking at your team playing that Saturday night um, here at Rogers Arena. The tough part is, is they finished their season on the Thursday night yeah. in Winnipeg. I was going to say, this would be a particularly tough draw for the Vancouver Canucks. And we already have the debate about, um, is there enough of an advantage to finishing in first place or finishing with quote unquote home ice in this league? Because the Canucks play the Winnipeg Jets in the Manitoba Capitol on Thursday, April 18th. If you're asking them to turn around with travel from two time zones away and host on Saturday, April 20th, that's a particularly big ask for a team that could well be first place in the Western Conference. That could well be the President's Trophy winner uh, in terms of whatever advantage they should get by finish, uh, finishing in those lofty in those lofty positions. We'll see where it goes. It, it, you know, obviously we like our Saturday night hockey here in (laughs) Canada. We have been conditioned that way. Um, so I can understand why Sportsnet may want games on Saturday, April 20th. You also have the Edmonton Oilers who are going to make those Stanley cup playoffs. You have the Winnipeg jets who are going to make the Stanley cup playoffs. And of course you have the Toronto Maple Leafs as well. So we'll see how it shakes out. There are some teams that play on that final Thursday of the regular season that are going to the playoffs. There are some that do not. I would like to think that they will make, uh, they will schedule make so that teams who aren't in action just 48 hours in advance play on that Saturday. Teams that have had a little more runway and the Canucks and others who play on the 18th start a little later. We shall see. All right, let's get to our top story. Failure to clinch. The Vancouver Canucks had an opportunity to be the first Western Conference team to clinch a playoff berth on Monday night, but they lose at Rogers Arena to the LA Kings. They lose 3-2 and um, now 4-2-1 and one on this epic nine-game homestand. They have four goals in regulation in three meetings with the LA Kings this, this season, Earth. They've got one win and two defeats. Are we starting to get concerned about this particular matchup for the Canucks? Cause it could happen. Yeah. Right. If Vegas were to surpass LA in the standings, then it's very conceivable that the Canucks could draw the Kings in the first round. Are we starting to get concerned that that passive one, three, one trap and what the Kings do defensively is a bit of an antidote for this Canucks team. Yeah, especially when your stars weren't really your stars against the LA Kings and really haven't been that much this season, to be completely honest. I know Brock Bester scored. Quinn Hughes got an assist last night, but Elias Pettersson, relatively quiet. JT Miller, relatively quiet. Um, Their big dogs weren't their big dogs. They got a Sam Lafferty, beautiful goal by Sam Lafferty, but in the playoffs, you're going to need your top guys to perform. And... A lot of criticism comes with this team when they take losses if the top guys aren't there. But when you go into the playoffs, you're going to need your top guys. And I think that that's the biggest thing when you look at this team. You know, the Leas Pedersons, the Quinn Hughes, the the JT Millers, Brock Bessers. And, you know, we can even throw Thatcher Demko in it. I know he's hurt. But if they're not there night in and night out, um, it's going to be hard for your hockey team to win games. And and last night was pretty evident of that. No doubt. Let's hear from JT Miller about... Well, and he acknowledges that getting on the inside, getting the scoring areas against this team has been a problem for the Canucks. Take a listen. I mean, you're not going to have a lead all the time going into the third period, and you're certainly going to have to come from behind. So um, constant learning lessons. Uh, you know, I mean, you, I mean, you want to win every game, obviously. We had some good pushes, but 
Uh, I think we, we just had a, we have a hard time, I think, getting on, the, getting on the inside sometimes against those guys, you know, and we need to do a better job. The forward's got to do a better job of getting there. Yeah, well, Earth, there's part of me that can't believe we're back here because, <laughs> no, I, I just, you know, we're both old enough to remember when a lot of teams in the NHL played this way yep. to the detriment of the entertainment value, right? And in some cases, and, and the Minnesota Wild were always exhibit A because of Jacques Lemaire and, and the fact that he was a great defensive forward on some great defensive Canadians, Stanley Cup teams, and then picked up and took uh, – elements of what himself and Bob Ganey and some of those other great early checking forwards mm -hmm. brought to the preseason and, and expanded it at a, a team level. And we've seen this in Vancouver with torts and guys collapsing in front of the net and all that. But I just, you know, the skill level now in the league is so good. Virtually everybody can handle the puck pretty well. Virtually everybody can skate. Like the product has gotten just so much more aesthetically pleasing. I think you can argue over the last five years or so. And the Kings are just an outlier. And so, you know, you, you look at your your timeline during a Canucks Kings game and you see people going like, I just, what am I watching? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I can't abide like anyone, but this team in the Stanley cup playoffs, a, because hey, the, they've had some success against the Canucks, but B because the games are just so awful against the LA Kings. So Canucks still lead the Western conference by a point. Uh, that's both That's both over the Colorado Avalanche and the Dallas Stars. Colorado's won nine in a row here and has a game in hand. So we'll see if they can get to top spot in the Western Conference because, of course, if not, that probably means the Nashville Predators yeah. who are on yet another <laughs> heater here, Earth. Incredible. Um, Quinn Hughes, you mentioned he gets on the score sheet and, and we have monitored this for some time, he has passed Yerke Lume and Dennis Kearns for all-time scoring by a Canucks defenseman. Next up is Matthias Oland in second place, and Quinn Hughes is just three points back of Matthias Oland. So I think it's fair to say, even with a potential load management scratch, who knows, we'll see, that Quinn Hughes is going to be your number two all-time scoring defenseman for the Vancouver Canucks at the conclusion of this season. And then the only guy left to pass will be Alexander Edler, who's at 409 points. And who knows if Hughes puts down another season, like the one he's having, he could very well around this time next year be right on the heels of Alexander Edler. We're going to play a clip from Hughes here um, because I thought it, we both listened to it and thought, mm -hmm. This is great insight on how Quinn plays the game, but it is also great insight into how Quinn Hughes thinks the game and the different things that he has got to be aware of when he's on the ice. Let's take a listen. It's something I got to be wary of, of just making sure that I'm getting to my point and making a, a great A chance instead of just exerting energy. And um, had some couple, you know, of that backhand in the second and a shot in the second I liked, both from the right side of the rink and. I'll take those chances any day, but um, as far as that, I think I'd you know probably want to have a couple more shots in that and, um, throughout the game. But I um, thought some guys played really well, and um, obviously not much case he can do on those two goals there. So I love that clip for a couple of reasons. One, what we just outlined. Two, there's a part of it that's concerning, right? Yeah. When you look at him and you see 26 minutes and 35 seconds and you hear about him expending energy, you know, it gets a little nerve wracking, I'm sure, for Canucks fans. It has been an extraordinary season for Hughes, but boy, does he play a lot. And you hope and pray that he's got a ton left for the Stanley Cup playoffs. But the second part I love about it is he's aware. Like yeah. he's aware of what a wasted energy <laughs> skate would be yeah. and what a dangerous scoring chance creation skate would be including right down to which side of the ice yeah he's best to do that on the hockey iq shone through in at, that clip at 24 years old too right i mean he's he's young and we just mentioned obviously he's going to lead the team in franchise records again 24 years old but i think the biggest thing for quinn hughes is yes like you mentioned matt he is so much smarter than almost every one of his teammates, to be completely honest, when the way that he thinks the game and sees the game, he picks up the puck at the blue line. He's probably beating 
almost everyone one-on-one -on -one up against the wall there. And then he skates down. You're beating the defenseman that's coming to get you. And at that point in his mind, he's thinking, why is there no one in front of the net? Why isn't there someone that I can get a, that I can throw the puck in front of goes off a leg. One of my teammates is there. And then I think when you look at it and you, we also heard from JT Miller, that's, that's, he's saying the same thing. We need to get in front of those areas to make those plays. And the Kings are a team that defensively, they just put everyone in front of the net. So for Quinn Hughes, the exerting the energy, yeah, it's pointless for him because none of his teammates are thinking the same thing to get in front of the net. And I think that that's why it was so frustrating for both of those players, yep. knowing that they can be way better at no, it. No, that's a great point. It dovetails perfectly yep. with what Miller was talking about, uh, getting to the inside. But therein lies one of the troubles against this team is you have this dynamic talent like Quinn Hughes that can create, but there just might not be enough space on that compacted inner ice to be able to um, generate the same number of goals as you might expect from the scoring chances that he's able to skate his way into. Now, staying with the defense, we saw Hughes and Ronick split up. We have not seen that a whole lot this year. Nope. In fact, very rarely. Hughes with Myers and the opportunity for Philip Ronick to quote-unquote anchor his own pair, which I feel has kind of become a, that will live in Canucks lore. I have a feeling Ronick at anchoring his own yeah. pair. Uh, Philip Ronick playing with Nikita Zadorov. What do you think of it? I mean, for anchoring his own pair, he led the team in shots. So he was doing something there trying to get the offense from his defense. Minus one, 2157 of ice time. Um, didn't look out of place, but you just really didn't notice him too much. And I think that that's maybe a good thing and a bad thing. You know, if from your defenseman, you're not being noticed. You're not on the wrong side of things all the time. But if you are being noticed, it's because you're doing good things. He took five shots. I really don't remember any of them, to be honest. And I was yeah. half the game watching. Yeah. A couple of them were just floating in, pucks on net. And I guess, it, you know, maybe it's good things happen. But if the goalie stops, freezes the puck, then it's a moot point, to be completely honest. Um Look, this this is gonna this conversation is gonna continue surrounding this player until they come to an extension with him. If they in fact do that, you're not paying him Quinn Hughes type of money like Quinn Hughes is making now. You're just you're just not. You know you don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think you can get up to that seven point eight wow. million dollar range. I because think because the case is gonna be there, right? Like and, the, the, and the case is there because Quinn Hughes is making him all the all 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 types of money. Okay. So now I'm almost at a point where is. Canucks management in the back of their mind saying, I know what we're doing here and I know things in the back of their agenda. They're saying, okay, well, let's put him with someone else and see if he can handle the big bucks. Do you think Do you think this is in response to all the talk about how much he's worth, the contract that Alan Walsh's agent and Rona turned down, which is what, in the six and a half million yeah. dollar range? Do you think this is the Canucks saying, okay, you think you're worth that kind of money? <laughs> Coach Talkett put him on his own pair, and let's see how he does. Do, yeah. you, do you draw a straight line there, Irv? No, I don't really think it is, but I think it's also Rick Talkett kind of being like, okay, well, we're at a point now where I need to figure out if this guy can handle a defensive pairing by himself. We're going to get into the parts of the playoffs here that I need to know I can trust this guy on his own. And if you can't, then that's where the issue falls if you're going to if you're the Canucks paying a guy that much money. Right. Earlier in the season, were you in a, I want to see this guy anchor his own yeah. pair? Yeah. For sure. Yeah, I was anyone, too. anyone can put up points with Quinn Hughes. Quinn Hughes got Luke Shen paid. Yeah. Well, and and the thinking has evolved, of course, and this is another storyline that we've had course through the Canucks season that, you know, don't saddle Quinn Hughes. As great as he is and as good as he's going to make his defense partner look, don't saddle him with a guy who is the pure defender. We used to always think, hey, put the offensive guy, particularly if he was little, Beside the big granite block defenseman, you got the best of both worlds. The thinking has evolved in terms of, no, put a guy who actually has some hands, actually has some skating ability, some offensive aptitude alongside your number one offensively inclined defenseman. And then you're going to really be able to watch him flourish. And not to mention the second guy in the pair is going to be able to flourish. And and really, Hughes and Ronick have been that. I know the points have gone down for Ronick since the All-Star break. Uh, Earth, but of course they have for everybody yeah. on the Vancouver Canucks. Another sto storyline we're covering here and observing is the Canucks have gone from that high-flying scoring team in the first half of the season to a more defensive-oriented group. We'll get to a stat on that here in a moment. But that is, is and was the thinking. So then, okay, if Hronik has to anchor his own pair, uh, do you like Myers in that spot Yeah, as they lined it up? I mean, because... The other options 
or at least the other options with the six defensemen he dressed yesterday are Cole, Susie, or Zadorov, a lefty playing on the right yeah, side. You're probably not doing that. I, and, and I think that I, I don't think that Quinn Hughes minded playing with Noel Juleson, to be completely honest. Now, I don't think that that's going to happen it, it, when we get to game one in the playoffs. But just going back to Philip Ronick for a second, I mean, Cam Robinson had a great tweet yesterday. We mentioned it on the show. A tale of two seasons. First 42 games played, 36 points. He was plus 32. The last 30, he's had nine points. I mean, yes, it's gone down in the Canucks League. You mentioned, Matt, have gone back to or have gone to that more defensive minded group. But if you're not producing at an offensive level, you better be stopping the puck from getting out of your net or you better be that shutdown guy that you can be dependent on if you want to be paid those big type of bucks. Here's something else that came out of last night, Monday's game against the Kings, and it's JT Miller. And I, I thought this was a uh, a pretty astute observation about the way the LA Kings reacted after they won this hockey game. Let's take a listen. You know, I love the fact when, you know, they're banging their, you know, I don't love losing games, but, you know, when other teams are banging their sticks and when that last puck's cleared out, you know, they, they know they just beat a good hockey team. I mean, it says a lot. And, uh, you know, we're, it's going to be a lot of hard games here coming down. This is good good prep for us, and we got to find a way to win games like that and, you know, not give up the late one in the second or whatever happened. And, you know, I mean, they're all, they're all tight against LA. I mean, that's just how it is going to be this time of year. Earth, Dallas, Vegas twice, L.A. again over the next two weeks. Winnipeg as well, near the end of the season. Well, yeah. Winnipeg and Edmonton near the end of the season. Are the Canucks a measuring stick now? Yep, they have to be. I mean, the target's been on their back ever since the start that they had. And, you know, we all looked at this team in the beginning and said, hey, that's going to fade. They're, they're going to come back to reality at some point here. Well, the reality is set in that they're a good hockey team, that they're a team that you're going to get your best game from – your opponent every single night, whether they're up in the standings or whether they're near the bottom feeders in, in the NHL, it's, they look at you and they say, okay, you know what? It, it might be a measuring stick game. It might be one of those games that says, if this is going to be our first round opponent, this is going to be how we have to play. The Dallas Stars can come in and say, could this be a team that we're going to be in the Western Conference final? Is this going to be one of those teams, right? So when you look at it, I mean, the Canucks should be able to pat their hands or pat their backs a little bit because they've been that good this season and they've been relentless in how good they've been. From another team's point of view, you're coming in and saying, okay, are these the big dogs? You know, they're in the race for President's Trophy along with seven other teams, but these are one of the big dogs of the league, and let, let's see how we stack up here. Well, and as mentioned, it's sort of been a tale of two seasons for the big dogs. The <laughs> first half of the season where the Canucks were winning games with goals galore. Uh, since the All-Star break, not as many goals. And then, of course, came the Thatcher Demko injury. And March 9th, so we're, what, two and a half weeks since the injury, Casey DeSmith has had to come in, and Casey DeSmith has played the last six hockey games in succession. And look, um, Casey DeSmith had done quite well as a backup goaltender. Uh, he has not really been a starter in his career, so we had questions about how he would handle the workload. But... And we see this all the time in the NHL. When you lose a star player, particularly when that star player is a netminder, mm -hmm. the rest of the group sort of has its attention captured and understands the need to play better defensive hockey. How does this strike you? The last 14 games. So, and again, DeSmith has played seven of those mm -hmm. six starts plus the one relief. So half of them DeSmith basically and half of them Demko, even maybe uh, a little more on the DeSmith side. The last 14 games, Canucks have given up 14 goals and 227 shots. Like, that's exceptional. Structure, right? And it's taken a while for them to get here, but this is the structure that they want to play. Keep teams wide. Don't let them get the puck on net. Block shots. Um, there was a play on Saturday night. I, I remember it um, against the Calgary Flames. Elias Pettersson laying out flat, blocking a shot, right? And, and I think when you look at it and you have that buy-in from every single player on that roster, bottom from your superstars all the way to your last defenseman that that play that doesn't play that much, or your four group that's only getting seven or eight minutes of ice time, when they're going out and they're laying out for blocking shots and doing those things, it's, it's everyone has bought into the system and the structure that Rick Tockett and his coaching staff have implemented. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at Thatcher Demko, he's 34 and 13. He's got a 917 save percentage. Mm -hmm. Like, that's not a finalist, almost. He probably should be. 
Well, that was was one thing yeah. I wanted to ask you. Does he have any chance to win it, or is finalist the best case scenario? I think finalist probably best case scenario. I mean, he maybe has a chance to win it, but I, I think it's finalist for sure. I mean, Connor Hellebuck's having a ridiculous season. Bobrovsky's, you know, knocking on the door as well, and there's some other pretty good goalies in the National Hockey League right now. Yeah, um, of course, you see Saros in yeah. Nashville. I mean, uh, Saros's numbers aren't necessarily uh, stackable with that no. group, but given what they're doing. In the second half, the other thing that uh, you and I were talking uh, talking about before we we fired up the live stream here, I I, I have to think Talkit is still the leader for the Jack Adams. Yeah, a- and I do think he has some cushion there as well. But you mentioned Spencer Carberry and what the Washington Capitals are doing here with the GM who wrote off the team and said we're we're playing. Or their future is our main concern. And here's Washington with a chance uh, to make the playoffs. In fact, sitting on a playoff spot tonight in a uh, Tuesday, going into Tuesday's action, uh, where some we've got some huge playoff implication games. Now, Florida is the defending Eastern Conference champion, but they were the eighth seed last year. So you got to like what Paul Maurice has done down in South Florida. I think he's got to be a candidate. Look, Torch was a candidate, maybe still is a candidate, but Philadelphia is fading here a little bit. I'm not sure the Sean Couturier business will help him. <laughs> uh, great job in Winnipeg, but Rick Bonus has missed a bunch of games on health matters, so you wonder whether that affects his candidacy. And, and then you got Andrew Burnett and what he's doing in that's, Nashville that's, in the second. That's that's, that's the one that I was going to ask you. I was going to say, are you going to give him any love? If, in fact, they do pull it off, do you give him any love? Like, do you have to think of it? Well, put it this way. Um, Talkit is still my leader there. Yep. If I'm filling out a ballot, Rick Talkit still gets the vote. And look, if they win the, if they're number one in the West and they win the president's trophy, then I think it has to be talked. Yeah, Forget about it. Yeah, I think it's done. But if the Canucks slip from here, uh, I think Brunette's going to get a lot of love because of the second half, because when you look at how just deeply out of it, Nashville was, at one point, you know, not to mention, you know, they have the little, sometimes a good story helps the, we canceled the team trip to you two at the sphere. They, <laughs> they didn't earn it. And then they played well to spend and then, coach. Yeah, exactly. And then we didn't lose for like a month and a half a, thereafter. Um, so I, I think Burnett will be there. And look, if, if Philly makes the playoffs, I could see torts getting, uh, being a finalist as well. If Philly doesn't, I think Paul Maurice or somebody else, Carberry, has an opportunity uh, to jump into the top three. There's a lot of good stories. I mean, he's not going to get it or maybe vote it, but if the Kings make the playoffs, Jim Hiller, and that, the way that he's been, he took over this season, right, and was able to go and get his team to play, obviously not a great style of hockey that fans enjoy watching, but it is proving that they have had success and they are able to do it at a high level. Well, I wonder if they would hold two things against Jim Hiller, number one style of play, number two, just yeah. not as many games yeah. coached as the other guys, not, not a full season. It brings me actually to the at rink-wide, at rink-wide man, rink-wide Vancouver poll question being asked today with 10, 10 games to go, which Canucks milestone is most likely to be reached? Miller at 100 points. He's at 91 now. Hughes at 90 points. He's at 81, Besser with 40 goals. He's three away with 37. Or Philip Ronick, who's five points shy of 50 on the season. Talk to me of, of those milestones. Which one do you think is most likely and which one are you rooting for? Well, if history suggests anything for this season. Brock Besser scores in bunches, so he's probably going to get to 40 at some point this week. And that's the one that I think I'd like to see the most. Yeah. Well, especially after the JPAT question of last year, right? Like, yeah. is this year to get to 30? This is the year I get to three. You know, to be able to say, hey, came back a year later after everything that went on, including a trade request that went unfulfilled, the contract that nobody wanted, yep. and got to the 40 goal plateau. Of course, we all have uh, a little bit of uh, every time I think of Brock Besser, there's a little, you know, coursing of empathy that shoots through mm-hmm. you because we know the battle as late father Duke went through and how close the family was and how much that weighed on Brock. So that's the one I think I would like most like to see happen. But honestly, with 
the way he's going, Irf, 10 more games for Miller to get nine more points. Yeah. He can get four against Anaheim on uh, Sunday. No, that's it. Yeah. Because, like, there are some Arizona games here. Yep. We know what they've looked like in the second half of the season. There's, a, the as you mentioned, the Anaheim game here. Um, now, still going to play L.A. <coughs> Excuse me. Edmonton, and I know they're a different animal than what we saw, but the Canucks had no trouble scoring against them early. I think Miller to 100 is really likely at this stage. JT sitting on 98 points, Matt. They've already clinched. They're not going to win the President's Trophy, but they're in the playoffs, and it's the final week of the season. How much do you load management if you're the head coach? That's, there? Or, that's a great or a call. Quinn, yeah. That's a great call. I haven't thought of it. Yeah. I suppose I would do what's best for the hockey club. I also would imagine that JT would present quite a case to <laughs> yeah. be playing in those games, but just don't ask him why he's looking at the stat. No, sheet. absolutely not. Um, no, good, good dilemma there, but I, I think he's going to get to a hundred points. And, and, and quite frankly, I think he deserves to get to a hundred points. I mean, to fall the one point short a couple of years ago, when he had such a marvelous season and he's just been outstanding uh, this year. And then, you know, Hughes, look, he's a point per game defenseman. And if he's better than a point per game defenseman, but you know, if one more from here, if it's all it would take for him to finish with 82 points, I, I, I still believe if he is out pointing Kale McCarr at the end of the year, and the Canucks finish ahead of the Colorado Avalanche, I think you're going to see Quinn Hughes win the Norris. Now, I would be a little less confident if Colorado finishes ahead of the Canucks, and of course they got a game in hand, one back, and I would be really concerned for Hughes if McCarr is able to pass him in points. Yeah, But um, 78 to 81... Right now, again, McCarr has a, a game in hand from here. But so long as those two things hold, I think we're looking at the first Norris Trophy winner in Vancouver Connects history. Let me ask you this, Matt. Can you sit here and say that Quinn Hughes is the Canucks' best player or maybe their most important player? I would argue he's certainly their most important. Okay. Yes. Is Kale McCarr Colorado's most important player or is it Nathan McKinnon? I would argue it's Nathan McKinnon. Okay. And then there, I think that's the way that but, I would look at it going into the voting. And I hear you there. Yeah. Uh, the, the distinction I would draw there is there is such a gap between Quinn Hughes and the Canucks next best yes. defenseman. That's true. Uh, with all due respect to Philip Ronick, but boy, are there some good defensemen in Colorado? So, like, when I look at their defense group and Taves and others, I, I go, well, boy, like, whoever they throw over the boards there mm -hmm. is pretty damn good. Um, whereas, you know, and as good a player as Rantanen is, the gap between McKinnon and the rest of the avalanche forwards. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question, I would I view Quinn Hughes as their best player and their most important player. Right. Yes, 100%. Now, if JT Miller gets team MVP this year, I think that's entirely deserved because <laughs> I think he's been awesome as well. It's really a coin flip. And frankly, Demko was in this conversation too before he got hurt. But, you know, day in, day out, game in, game out, year in, season in, season out, Quinn Hughes is my guy in terms of their best player and their most important player. Yeah, most important player and most valuable player. Maybe two different things as well when no, you look true. at things, right? Because Demko, probably their most valuable when he's healthy. Mm -hmm. Demko, or Quinn Hughes, night in and night out, is definitely their most important player. And then obviously the argument can be made for JT Miller and Elias Patterson as well. I mean, I've said since the beginning when those two guys were very young and you know just starting their careers, like this team is going to go as far as you know 40 and 43 yeah. take them. Um, while you brought, Since you brought them up, are you at all concerned about Elias against some of the better teams? I think it's interesting when you look at it. I mean, he gets leaned on pretty heavily. The book from some some guys and playing against him is, you know, he doesn't like the big heavy physical game. I know he throws the reverse hits a lot, and he's very good at that, and that's how he establishes positioning. But guys don't like being hit. Um, and it, it's one of those things like, you know, when they changed the power play and Miller went back to the left, and that game that Pedersen had where he, you know, he dangled, put the puck through his legs and around his back, and he went on the bench and smiled after he did that. You saw that confidence. You saw that kind of sparkle back in his eye, but it wasn't against a good team, right? And when you look at it, these big, bruising, physical teams, 
Um, it's something that, you know, Elias Pedersen kind of still has a knock on him. It, it, can, can he get up for those games? Is it, are those the games that he really enjoys playing in? And, you know, I know we make so much talk about, you know, well, he's played in the bubble and he was excellent in the bubble. This is Elias Pedersen's, to be completely honest, this is going to be his first taste of real playoff action. He has said that himself. Yeah, Herf. this is it. Real playoff action, a way, you know, advantage. You know, you're going to get the home ice fans on you. There's going to be media covering you every single day. It, it, your entire city is going to be focused on you every single day for however long your run is. So this is something that you're going to have to get used to. But um, I, I don't know if I'm concerned is the right word because he's got the skill and he's so good. But it is one of those things that maybe there are a little, some red flags against the better teams. Yeah, here, here's what I will say. We both agree on this, that if you're going to wait Thatcher Demko's bubble performance against Vegas where he was so fantastic yeah. in terms of coming in and relieving an injured Jacob Markstrom and really giving them a chance in that series, an opportunity to go to the Western Conference final, um, then you have to wait Elias's playoffs as well. If you want to throw them out, then throw them all out for all the Canucks players, those who succeeded, those who did not succeed in the Edmonton bubble of four years ago. Okay, prospect side of things here. Jonathan Lekramaki has arrived. There is video of him <laughs> skating in Abbotsford. David Quadrelli on the beat. Something tells me, Grady, that Quadrelli has been waiting since the moment they called his name at the draft to get out to Abbotsford and get some video of Lekramaki, right? Oh, yeah, and he's in scramble mode today trying to get back uh, to make the show at 2 p.m. Tough traffic, <laughs> middle of the day. You f are you uh, free to fill in on Connects Conversation? <laughs> yes, no, absolutely. Today, tomorrow, okay. I can do right. it. No hey, problem. Quads, if you want, I'll just stay here. I'll get the show started, and we'll pass <laughs> the baton off to you like a relay race. Um, so, Lekramaki skating with Abbotsford. We'll see if he gets in a game there. Expect you want to see that. Also know he's going back to Sweden to try out for the World Championship team. Of course, had a terrific season. And in a lot of cases, Irf, like he's the profile that they need, right? The scoring winger who's got the big shot and can score some goals from distance and make some of these centermen even better. Now it's not going to happen this year that much. We know, but perhaps starting as soon as next season, we can be looking at uh, another potent offensive forward to add, add to this group. Also want to get to a couple of other Canucks prospects uh, that our friend Dave Hall of Canucks army has been tweeting about recently Sawyer Minio, the defenseman with the Seattle Thunderbirds. His season is wrapped up here. Uh, as Dave notes, he finished second on the Thunderbirds in both goals at 16 and points at 53. Uh, his goals ranked fifth in the WHL actually amongst defensemen. And Dave says there was a tons of growth, all situation growth, this year for Minio. So he's looking like a nice pick from that draft as well, which also of course included Hunter Bastevich who's already yeah. been used to land El uh, Elias Lindholm. And then Kirill Kudryatsev, the Russian defenseman playing in the Ontario hockey league. His season's not done, but his regular season is 47 points, five goals, 42 assists in 67 games, 10th in points for OHL defenseman dave says what what stood out this year vast improvement to his overall game he finished plus 29 which was up 44 from last year and he's going to get an opportunity to further showcase himself in the ontario hockey league playoffs where his sault ste marie greyhounds will face the guelph storm so hockey season's wrapping up mm -hmm. kind of around the Continent, NHL, AHL still going on. Of course, WHL going on. You got the Giants, you got the Royals, you got the Rockets, you got the Cougars and up in Prince George, all in the WHL playoffs. So we'll be following those, those as well. And frankly, selfishly, hoping for some uh, BC versus BC series Absolutely. in the dub as it goes along. Let's get to today's menu. It is brought to you by Ben Moss Jewelers. Ben Moss Jewelers, proudly Canadian-owned, operated with a history dating back more than 100 years. Five locations in BC, including Willowbrook in Langley, Coquitlam Centre. Committed to customer satisfaction, you can check out the large selection of Canadian mined lab -grown, uh, and lab-grown diamonds. The mined diamonds are available on a payment plan that suits your need. For more info, you can check out Ben Moss 
Ben.com. Ben Moss for the love of jewelry. John Shannon's going to join us here in a moment, playing to get to with John, both on the season side of things, the NHL side of things, and of course, the Vancouver Canucks. We'll do some hashtags, the best and worst of Twitter, where on the heels of a baseball gambling scandal, <laughs> we have one in the NBA as well. And the epicenter is Toronto with a reserve big man who don't like the evidence against him at this point. Wow. No, not in the least. Also, Stefan Radzinski. He's a race car driver, lives here in Vancouver. And this is amazing. You don't see a lot of this. Stefan is sponsored by our friends at the Applewood Auto Group. It is very unusual to see a regional automotive group going full bore into a livery sponsorship of a race car driver. But that's exactly what's happened here. Stefan is racing in the Pirelli GT4 series. It gets going next month in California. He was, he idolized Greg Moore growing up. So a fantastic conversation coming up later with Stefan. Hey, you, no, not, not you, you, are you, uh, you an owner operator? You have a fleet of trucks or cars. Well, CalPro Plus might be the dedicated tire program just for you. Free program includes exclusive deals and savings, price match guarantee, flexible financing, and preferred pricing on everything you drive. Also, you get a dedicated member support line. That means that you can get questions answered. Also, they'll source and recommend the right tire for you, your application, and your budget. Cal Tires Network of 260 plus stores are here to help so you can focus on the road ahead. Sign up for free at calproplus.com. In a season like this, you never want to miss a single second of what's happening on the ice. And you want to be around your fellow fans, right? Well, Greta Bar YVR at 50 West Cordova, the perfect spot to do so. Hey, if you've got tickets, a great place to pre and post. They've got drink specials every single day. And if you don't have tickets, well, stick around and soak up the atmosphere with all your fellow fans. Play all the great video games and air hockey. Great air hockey set up as well at Greta Bar YVR. We'll see you there, 50 West Cordova. John Shannon, the former executive producer of Hockey Night in Canada, the co-host of the Bob McCowan podcast. He joins us now. You stay up late to watch the Kingston Connects, John? Uh, what do you think? Of course you did. <laughs> of course so I if did. You were, if you were going to skip, I guess this one was a little earlier, but if you were going to skip... Boy, the LA Kings, not a particularly exciting brand of hockey these days. <laughs> no, but uh, I think people in the organization would call it winning hockey when you think that uh, what Jim Hiller has and his staff have brought to the table for the Kings. And, and, and let's also be pretty frank that they, they were finally getting some goaltending again um, and playing better structured defensively. And then two of the guys that were – I'm trying to be diplomatic here. Two, two of the guys that were problems when Todd was coach uh, are starting to contribute, and that's P.L. Dubois and Kevin Fiala. And so all of a sudden, uh, the Kings are a hard out, and the Kings will be a hard out uh, the rest of the way and, and into the playoffs. Is that the team you'd want to avoid if you're the Canucks based on uh, uh, no, I, this? Uh, this has been a great question uh, for the last two or three days in, in everywhere in the Western Conference, and if I'm president or general manager of a team, I'm going to the meetings and saying, can, can the first place team get a buy? <laughs> I don't. There are going to be good teams in the West go to the playoffs in less than 14 days. That's mm -hmm. just a reality of how good the top eight teams are uh, in the conference. And, and if you look at it right now, uh, on here we are on the 26th of March. If I told you the two best teams, two best teams right now are the Los Angeles Kings and the Nashville Predators, uh, and both of them, you know, are are not in the one two positions in either divisions. I, yeah. I I don't think you could disagree with me. No, uh, Nashville has been extraordinary. I mean, rip off another five game win streak here. Um, well, let me ask you this then: Aiden Hill out for Vegas. Would you, do you have any concerns about them in the second wild card spot? Five points up on the Blues. Uh, I have concerns about Vegas on their goaltending period. 
Uh, that has been the, 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 the weak link in the team since Christmas time. They have not been able to get consistent goaltending out of Hill or Logan Thompson. And they, you know, remember we used to always, there always used to be the joke about Vegas goaltending. They could go five deep. Well, there's no five deep anymore in Vegas when it comes to goaltending. It's two, uh, and it's a long drop to Yuri Patera. Uh, and so if I'm Kelly McCrimmon, I'm, you know, I'm going to Lourdes and hoping Aiden Hill is okay. Uh, and then hopefully that Logan Thompson can recapture some of the glory that he had last year before he got hurt. That's their biggest problem. We all know how good the defense can be. We all know that, uh, you know, push comes to shove in the first round of the playoffs that we're going to see Thomas Hurtle. We, I'm not sure about Mark Stone yet, but they're going to be a tough out other than goaltending. That is their biggest problem. Yeah, I think we're going to see Hurdle before the end uh, of the regular season, if they can do it cap-wise. Yeah, John, when you look at another team and goaltending, I mean, the Edmonton Oilers, we all know the firepower they have up front. Their defense has gotten better, but another team that is kind of going to depend on how good goaltending is come playoff time. And, I, and Irf, I'll tell you what, I am not concerned about Stuart Skinner. Yeah. I'm not. Uh, I, I think he's he's just fine. Uh, I think he's had a very good season. It's a long season. I think what they're trying to do and what they've tried to do in the last three or four weeks until the end of the regular season is make sure that he's rested before he got to the playoffs. Because last year in the playoffs, he was tired and it affected his play. And, and you I know that it's, you know, people get concerned at Edmonton. Well, people get concerned at Edmonton about everything. Um, but the, con the concern is, is Stuart Skinner good? Stuart Skinner is good enough. And the question is, can he be rested before the playoffs start? Do you have a problem with the NHL moving its playoff start time back to the 20th? Two no. days after the regular season? No, because the, there is enough of a stagger during that last week of the regular season that they can place teams uh, on the Saturday night. You know, it's funny. It was, it was a very subtle move because I'm one of those guys that does check the critical dates calendar all the time. And, and there it was. It was the 22nd. It was the 22nd. And then somebody mentioned something to me and I went and checked and there it was the 20th. Uh, and so from that perspective, uh, what you need to do for your partners, and in this case, that means people at Disney and people at Rogers and the people at TNT is uh, give them weekend dates. They prefer weekend dates to start the playoffs. The New York Rangers, for instance, finish much earlier in the regular season than, say, the Colorado Avalanche and the Edmonton Oilers, who finish on the Thursday. So I don't suspect we'll see an Oilers or Avalanche game on Saturday night, but I simply think it's possible to see a New York Ranger Stanley Cup playoff game on the Saturday night and and perhaps even a Vancouver Canuck game on the Saturday well, night. I, I, I was going to ask, because the Canucks are in Winnipeg that Thursday, the 18th. Would would they ask Vancouver to play Saturday night? I think uh, that it, I think what happens though at this well, and, and here, here the schedule maker at the league, Steve Hatz Petrus, is is brilliant with his matrix. Um, you know, I think they've probably told everybody to leave dates open. Uh, you know, and and be prepared for absolutely anything at this point. Uh, you were still in the in the realm. And people are going to snicker at this. We're still in the realm trying to have teams and people that own arenas trying to generate revenue post-COVID. So if there's a concert coming and there's a lot more concert coming, then you're going to try to book concert. And then you, but you still have to make sure your available dates are there for the Stanley Cup playoffs. So from that perspective, you know there are going to be times where there's going to be a concert. If the Canucks are forced to play on the Saturday night, and this is just my supposition, if the Canucks are forced to play the Saturday night, then there will be another gap early in that playoff schedule to allow for a team to have a bit of rest. And is it building availability, number one driver, and then broadcast once or needs in that order, John? That's a good question. Uh, my answer is I think that they have to fulfill the partner wishes first. So I, I think it's television driving Saturday night. If, you, know, you, you know, like we saw last Saturday night, we, it ended up being an Anthers on ABC 
in the United States. I think that tells you that there's a, a, a need for live sports or live television for the U.S. networks on Saturdays as well. And so I think that there, there's probably going to be a push from the people in Bristol to say, we'd like to have some Saturdays and could you give us the 20th? I don't think you want to go a weekend. Maddie, I don't think you want to go a weekend in April without hockey. I, it didn't make, it doesn't make much sense. No, it doesn't. I'll say this though. I mean, we may not know who's playing yeah. whom on the evening of the 18th with the potential for a Saturday 20th start yes. to the Stanley cup playoffs. Yeah. Tough. You know, <laughs> no, because you, you won't know you, you, at the end of the first round, you may not know. And you might have to start two Fair days enough. later. Too. I mean, you got, you, it, this is not the time to be worried about schedule as much as it is. Okay. Are we prepared? Are we healthy? Um, and, but you know what? You have so much money at stake now. It's between the two countries and the, and the contracts. It's, it's over a billion dollars. Um, so you better be in a position to give those partners content on a weekend. I think, I think that's really the key thing. I was surprised to see it as a 22nd at one point, in fact, but perhaps there was some logic behind that. But now the 20th, to me, makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. John, first time in league history, seven teams are in the president's trophy race. League must have to be happy about that where there's so much parity within the league. Now, no one's running away with it. Well, I, I think what it tells you is that uh, people in the know in New York will say we don't need more than 16 teams in the playoffs because our <laughs> month of March is the playoffs. This is our preliminary round. And uh, there are a few of us have been saying that for a while. Like this, like this is... This is almost like a Super Tuesday today. When you look at the schedule and the matchup of all these games and the storylines of a ton of games going on tonight, it's fantastic. You know, 12 games, I'm, uh, you know, I, I try to watch as many as I can. I'm not sure I can watch everything I want to watch. You know, even, even the simpler stories. Jake Gensel's going home to Pittsburgh tonight. That's a cool story uh, at a difficult time in Penguins history. Uh, but at the, but and then you've got Winnipeg and Edmonton who are both coming off awful weekends and they've got to right the ship and they've got to improve their playoff positions. So there are, so there are a ton of great stories on the schedule tonight. And that's, I think the thing that you're, that you're alluding to. There are a ton of stories every night. Like look, we had two games last night. Both games were important. I don't think when you draw a schedule up, uh, you know, a year ago, you, you're going to know that, Vegas, St. Louis, and L.A., Vancouver are going to be important games on a Monday night, but they were. Well, and it, scoreboard watching has been a lot of fun here oh, uh, recently. You know, because, as Earth notes, at the top, it's so tight. Uh, every day, it seems like we've got a new leader in the clubhouse for the President's Trophy. And um, much as we might be lacking at the bottom of the West in terms of the playoff race, unless St. Louis can get its act together here and maybe make a run at Vegas, uh, that final Eastern Conference wild card yeah. spot is pretty well contested. Oh, by the way, as well tonight, Detroit's in Washington. Right. Yeah. You there know, you go. I mean, so all of a sudden, another game that you know is must see TV. So mm -hmm. it's 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 a perfect time. That, and and really, I mean, the Caps are such a great story. Uh, when you you consider what Brian McClellan did that weekend before the trade deadline, when he he, we had the whole Kuznetsov story. We had him coming out saying that we're going to, you know, we're, we're looking towards the future. And all his team has done since then is win improbable games, including last Friday night's game against Carolina, which was a circus to watch. Um, so from, from that perspective, you know, Washington's going to be third in the, in the division before it's over. Washington will end up playing either the Rangers or Carolina in the first round. And, you know, that I'm not sure that's the reward for being third. Uh, but at the same time, you know, that's that's where the cap of changing. Spencer Carberry's done an amazing job there. You know, Alex Ovechkin's bought in and is now scoring. And now the Gretzky race is back on, which is kind of cool. Mm. Uh, back on the Canucks, let's ask you our Tim Hortons poll question. He, uh, he was sat down last night with a day-to-day -day injury. Uh, Elias Lindholm as a Vancouver Canucks, uh, Canuck, John. Re remind us what you thought off the top when they made the deal 
nine points in 22 games. As mentioned, he's a little nick now. We're asking, would you do that trade again if you're the Canucks? Sure. Sure, I would. Um, I, I would because uh, I, I, I bought him for the playoffs. I didn't buy him for the regular season. Uh, you know, he will be a valuable player for the hockey club come, what, the 20th or 22nd of April. That's when he was acquired for. At this point, he's just a rental, right? Um, you know, so from that perspective, you, 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 you brought him in to assimilate him earlier. Um, and when you get to the Stanley Cup playoffs and the players aren't being paid, it's just try to get to the Stanley Cup championship. And that's what Lindholm is going to try to do. To rest it makes a ton of sense. You know, the Oilers did this with Evander Kane in Ottawa, too. They need those types of players. The Canucks need Lindholm. The Oilers need Kane for the postseason. They don't necessarily need them right now. John, one final one for me, I guess. What's the sense around this Vancouver Canucks team as you talk to NHL GMs that are going to play them? I know, you know, I'm talking to guys that say that they're, they want to play the Canucks in the playoffs because they're a team that, you know, they lack the experience of, of the star power that's, you know, seen playoffs and what it's really going to be like. So what's the sense that from around the league of teams looking at this team going in? Um, well, I, I think everybody marvels at the story in the first place, Irv. Yeah. It, it is one of the best turns around we've seen in a long time. Um, I also think it's a much different team in the playoffs if it's Thatcher Demko rather than Casey Smith. And it's not a knock at the Smith. I think he's done yeoman's work really well. But Thatcher Demko should be in the Vezina discussion. Casey Smith will never be in that discussion. So it, it's a different team with Demko. Um, and it, and it'll be a better team when Lindholm is in the lineup too. So I'm not sure that anybody's sitting there saying, "Oh, you know what? The Canucks are going to be an easy out." There, are, there are no easy outs in the West. There are no easy outs in the West. This goes back to our discussion, Maddie, last week. Well, how do you view the success of the Canucks uh, for the season if they lose in the first round? And I, you know, I mean. People get greedy after the success the Canucks have had this year. Really greedy. And they should. They should enjoy it and get to the playoffs. And, you know, if they get through the second round, then I'm going to start to maybe have the champagne a little bit on ice. Yeah. But that's, that to me is is – is is where the the measure of success will be if they get to the second round. Yeah, and I I think you were a little gentler than Blake and I last week, but uh, no, I I think it would be a disappointment. Isn't that always the case, though? It's probably always the case, yeah. Sean. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> um, I just think it'd be a little bit disappointing to go all this way, be like right, right there at the top of the table for most of the year and not win a playoff. But, but this, round. It, but this, and I think if they win a playoff round, then I think oh. everybody feels pretty happy about it. And beyond that, you can call it gravy. We did have harsher listeners, John, say you don't give up what you gave up for Lindholm just to win a round. That was more an all-in signal of a trade. But, you know, it's just so darn hard to win this thing that if you make it to the final eight from where Vancouver was last year at the beginning of the year, uh, I, I think they can feel reasonably good about that. Oh, no, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Yeah. Um, but, But... You, you know, what we have to do with the 16 teams that are going to get into the playoffs, and this is not just a Vancouver thing, you have to prepare yourself that well, there are going to be four or five really good teams out in the first round. Four or five, not one, but four or five. That's a reality of what the playoffs are going to be like in 2024. Can I circle back? You think, sure. do you think Demko still has a chance at the Vezina here? even with missing all these games? Uh, I think he has a chance to be a finalist. Yeah, yeah. I do. Yeah. Uh, whether he wins it, I mean, it, it, you know, is, is another question. But if, if if the Professional Hockey Writers Association are putting together their ballot, I think he's in the top three. Yeah. No, I, uh, I agree with you there. It's just an unfortunate injury for that specific goal um, because, boy, the – guy in Winnipeg just keeps winning and keeps playing great hockey. Well, I mean, Connor Hellebuck had a Bobsky's brutal weekend. coming here too. Yeah. Yeah, Connor Hellebuck had a brutal weekend. So, I mean, if you, you you can't measure it on single events or two or three days. You have to look at the body work and, and based on the body work, Denko deserves to be there. 
Yeah, and uh, even after a brutal weekend, he still leads Demko in goals against average and save percentage a couple wins back. And, uh, of course, uh, a couple of um, Bobrovsky and Saros are coming here too. Um, with what Washington or with what Nashville is doing, with what Florida is doing as well. Uh, John, marvelous stuff. Thank you for the time here today, sir. And we will catch up next week. It's always great to catch up on the old pal Earth, too. Oh, good. Oh, thank you, John. Appreciate Are you it. like responsible for his career? Did you uh, get him started or anything? No, 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 no. But we, we, we did a little bit of work together. Okay. All right. At, uh, when we were working at the Empire, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I asked just because John has been responsible for yes, so many careers uh, across this country. Uh, can I tell a quick story? Can I Please. tell a quick story? Uh, it was social media, social media on the weekend. Ron, Ron went a little awry on Saturday night asking Bobby McMahon about uh, whether he knew Glenn Sather's mother's dress shop in Wainwright <laughs> in the 50s. Mm-hmm. And, and somebody, somebody said... Ron's kind of Ron's, you know, asking silly questions, and somebody says, "I blame John Shannon for that." So, <laughs> <laughs> Were you in his ear telling, "Ask about Wainwright, the dress shop in Wainwright"? <laughs> there was a day I would have been in his ear. It wasn't Saturday night. <laughs> yeah, awesome. good show. Thanks, John. Cheers. Hey, everybody! If you're enjoying what you're seeing here then follow along with Sakaris and Price on YouTube. I promise more content coming. They call it, the kids call it subscribe on YouTube. Well, how about liking it? Do that as well. Smash it right now.